Thank you, everyone. It's 55 minutes after the hour, and we will reconvene the ACIP meeting. We'll move next to our monkeypox vaccine session, and we'll begin uh, with Dr. Pablo Sanchez, who is a monkeypox or mpox vaccines workgroup chair, who will provide an introduction and overview of today's session. Good morning. As you recall, the global MPOX outbreak occurred in 2022, with the first case identified in the United Kingdom in May of 2022. Um, it primarily affected gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, was associated with person-to-person -person spread via close skin-to-skin -skin contact, including sex, and certainly deaths occurred primarily among persons with severe immunocompromise from advanced HIV. U.S. case counts and deaths comprised a third of the cases and deaths, and as you can see there, over 30,000 cases um, with 54 deaths. So the current um, global cases you can see on this slide here, um, with orange, the United States being in orange and uh, representing 30 to 99 cases, and then um, there's also um, large number of cases in, um, in Southeast Asia and Indonesia. So uh, as a reminder for the Geneos vaccine that we'll be um, discussing today, the, it is, it's comprised of a replication deficient vaccine virus. Um, it is a live virus, but replication deficient. It's administered subcutaneously via two vaccine doses 28 days apart. Its effectiveness was assessed by comparing immunologic response to that for ACAM 2000. It was licensed for prevention of both smallpox and mpox, and it is recommended currently for persons with HIV and other immunocompromising conditions, and it's licensed for persons 18 years of age or older. There is a current NIH trial underway to evaluate the safety and immunogenicity for persons 12 to 17 years of age. The, the uh, recommendations for the outbreak recommendations um, were previously um, discussed in the February and June ACIP meetings. And in June, we voted to that we recommend the two-dose Geneos vaccine series for persons aged 18 years and older at risk of MPOX during an MPOX outbreak. The, if you remember with respect to the MPOX outbreak, um, the public health authorities will determine whether there is an MPOX outbreak, and a single case may be considered an MPOX outbreak at the discretion of the public health authorities. Outbreak recommendations were intended for, for any U.S. MPOX outbreak, regardless of whether it was associated with male-to-male -male sexual contact. And the clinical guidance, including about use of the vaccine in children during outbreaks, were discussed as well. So the vaccination before exposure to MPOX virus, pre-exposure vaccination during the current outbreak, was recommended for the, the following individuals, gay, bisexual, and other MSM, transgender, or non-binary uh, people, including adolescents who fall into aforementioned, those uh, aforementioned categories, who in the past six months have had new diagnosis of one or more sexually transmitted diseases, more than one sexual partner, and people with the following in the last six months, sex at a commercial sex venue, sex in association with large public events in geographic areas, where MPOX transmission is occurring, sexual partners of people with the above risks, people who anticipate experiencing above risks, people with HIV or other causes of immunosuppression who have had recent or anticipate potential MPOX exposure. So the World Health Organization is embarking on development of elimination program of human to human trans um, elimination of human to human transmission of MPOX. Um, certainly, additional resources and data are needed, and certainly immunization 
may be and will, will be one component of the strategy for a worldwide elimination of the MPOX disease. Elimination, though, is a complex issue that was, has not been addressed by the work group. However, a recommendation that persons at risk for MPOX during the ongoing outbreak uh, receiving the vaccines, if, they've not already, the vac if they have not already received it, may support any upcoming um, strategy from the World Health Organization with respect to future elimination of MPOX. Next slide. So the recommendations that will be proposed during today's meeting will be that ACIP recommends vaccination with the two-dose Janeo's vaccine series for persons aged 18 years and older at risk for MPOX. And the, it's important to say that these, interim, these would be interim recommendations that can be revisited in two to three years. And you can see this, the uh, dose um, dose two would be administered 28 days after dose one. It's a two-dose schedule. And the persons at risk are the same ones that we've mentioned previously. Next slide. So the potential implications of the interim re routine recommendation that um, we plan uh, that will be for a vote today will increase vaccine coverage and prevent or minimize future outbreaks and control the current outbreak. Um, it would remove some stigma and facilitate one-to-one -one consultation with clinicians during their appointments for vaccination. Next slide. And the, also it heralds the potential com commercialization of the Janelle's vaccine. The product sponsor, Bavarian Nordic, has indicated that they will attempt to commercialize the vaccine if it is on a routine schedule. And so this will transition the vaccine from US government stockpiles, which are intended for smallpox preparedness, to the commercial sector. Next slide. So this is the tentative timeline for ACIP discussions and votes. So today would be interim routine recommendations and clinical guidance. Then in early of 2024, publication of two MMWRs are planned, the use of the Janeos vaccine during MPOX outbreaks, and the use of the Janeos vaccine among persons at risk during the ongoing MPOX outbreak. Then possibly in 2024, we would consider the results from an ongoing NIH trial on the use of the Janeos vaccine in adolescents aged 12 to 17 years of age. And then to be determined would be the review of epidemiology, cost effectiveness analysis, and other data to determine if routine recommendation should be continued beyond the next two to three years. Next slide. So the, again, the proposed recommendation would be that ACIP recommends vaccination with the two-dose Janeos vaccine series for persons aged 18 years and older at risk for MPOX. Next slide. So for today, there will be updates from the ongoing outbreak. The epidemiology will be presented by Dr. Um, Faisal Minhaj. Uh, the evidence recommendations framework by Dr. Agam Rao, and the clinical guidance and next steps also by Dr. Rao. Um, there'll be an MPOX vote and as, as for the recommendation, as well as an MPOX uh, vote for the vaccines for children's vote. A uh, reminder that the, this is for 18 years of age or over, so the MPOX vaccines for children vote would be for the 18-year-olds. Next slide. So I'd just like to thank my co-ACIP member, Beth Bell, who is um, part of the ACIP um, work group, um, and she's been invaluable um, to the discussions. Um, I'd like to thank the ex officio and liaison members as well. Um, uh, and I just want to mention from ACOG, Howard Minkoff, and from the AAP, Jim Campbell, um, were very helpful, as well as um, Jane Sucker from the New York State, um, from New York, that provided a lot of, um, of important data as well. And then also invited consultants, 
um, mainly subject matter experts, um, Dr. Damon and Stuart Isaacs were really invaluable um, to, the, uh, to the work group discussions. Next slide. And then also clinician experts uh, from SDIs and HIV and NPOX, uh, Jason Selker among them, and Kim Workowski, as well as Bonnie Maldonado. Actually, all of them were really extremely helpful. Immunization experts, um, health equity experts, as well as occupational medicine and work, um, worker safety. Next slide. And really cannot thank enough the CDC contributors as uh, listed on this slide, uh, particularly the work group lead, Agam Rao, who's really done an am amazing and really a spectacular job in coordinating all of these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at well, we pull up and ask Dr. Minaj to present the next uh, presentation. Dr. Long, did you have a quick question? I do have a quick question. Um, are you or someone else going to give us a little tutorial on interim, interim recommendations to be revisited in two to three years? Um, is that related to will it be implementable, related to will there be monkeypox around, and when do we do this? And, and if you're going to cover that at some other point, I don't need that answer now, but it just strikes me it's maybe something we should do for everything. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Long. I'm going to suggest we keep moving and then um, revisit this conversation uh, as we're discussing what the vote will look like. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will start with situational awareness and updates. This is an epi curve displaying the number of cases reported to CDC from the beginning of the outbreak in 2022 to September 28th, 2023. The peak of MPOX cases occurred during August of 2022 and have decreased substantially in 2023. Let's take a closer look at the numbers in 2023 since they are not visualized well on this slide. Looking at case counts from the beginning of the year to now, we see that they have not reached zero at any point. The black line represents the seven-day moving average of average cases detected daily, the blue bar is signifying daily case counts. Next slide. During the months of January, the seven-day average case range was generally between five and seven cases per day. Next slide. Cases decreased in February down to one to three cases per day. Next slide. However, they rose again in the summer months up to five cases per day. Next slide. From July to now, we still see cases at an average of one to four cases per day and have not been consistently below this level, highlighting that MPOX has not been eliminated from the United States. Next slide. When looking at the cases in 2023 geographically, we see that cases are occurring across the US in different jurisdictions. This map highlights cases detected from January to October from each jurisdiction. Looking at the image, we can see that cases are spread out. Many of these are not linked to other known cases, suggested of commu uh, continued community transmission or potential underdiagnosis. We know that during the height of the outbreak in summer of 2022, when clinician awareness was high and vaccine campaigns were occurring, the rate of undiagnosed MPOX was likely low, around 1% in the MSM population. However, currently, since we see unlinked cases across jurisdictions, this suggests additional ongoing transmission or underdiagnosis. Next slide. We have also seen cases in patients following vaccination. This has been reported since the outbreak started, including some clusters, but is relatively rare in comparison to the total case counts. Importantly, most patients with infection following vaccination have mild illness. On the right-hand side of the screen, we highlight data from a recently published manuscript on infections following vaccination. You can see that the median number of lesions in these patients was two, with an interquartile range of one to five. Additionally, only two out of 30 patients received tecovirumet, and few were hospitalized, suggestive that illness was mild following vaccination. Next slide. Reinfection of MPOX is rare and was not well reported until the current outbreak. 
Potential reinfection cases have been published in the literature, but only a few with convincing evidence of true reinfection. In the right is an image from a recently published case series where the authors found a total of eight probable cases of reinfection. Reinfection appears to be mild with a lower lesion count and duration of rash. CDC is aware of less than 10 cases of probable reinfection, which makes up less than 0.001% of cases. Next slide. CDC's MPOX Clinical Consultation Service was created early in the outbreak to discuss any MPOX case and transitioned to be a resource for treatment and guidance on managing severe MPOX cases. The consultation service is the only way to access most medical countermeasures available for severe MPOX. These consultations include some new cases, but many are repeated consultations on infections that began months ago and require numerous of courses of available medical countermeasures. From the beginning of the outbreak to now, 54 people have died in the United States, with another two this past September. As we previously published last year, people with severe MPOX and deaths share the same equity disparities that we see between cases and vaccination. Black persons make up the majority of severe cases, and most severe cases often have advanced HIV or AIDS, not on antiretrovirals at diagnosis, are not linked to care, and many are experiencing homelessness, and importantly, not vaccinated with Geneos. Next slide. This graph has a number of cases reported to CDC on the y-axis and the age distribution on the x-axis, with genders and different colored bars. The gender and age distributions of MPOX cases has not changed since our June ACIP presentation. Most cases are among cisgendered males, highlighting the population for which Geneos vaccination is recommended. Next slide. The race and ethnicity of reported cases remain similar to what was reported in June. This graph displays the race and ethnicity distribution by month with the total number of cases in each month listed above the corresponding column. Early in the outbreak, greater than 40% of cases were detected in white persons, but during the peak of last year, black and Hispanic persons were most affected. Recently, there have been cases across different racial and ethnic groups, but with large proportions of cases among black and Hispanics throughout the outbreak, achieving vaccine equity is needed to address this disparity. Next slide. Globally, we are seeing a different trend of cases than that of North America. This is an epi curve of cases reported to the WHO from April to September, with the different WHO regions in different colors. There have been large increases in Southeast, Southeast Asian and Western Pacific regions, as represented by the orange and green colors, respectively. We've also seen over the past month, the European region in the salmon red color has also seen one of its largest relative increases from August to September. Next slide. Many recent increases were co from countries in East and Southeast Asia as seen on the figure above, which displays case detections from September 4th to September 24th, 2023. We know that these are not the only countries in this region experiencing an increase in cases. Earlier this week, there were news reports of new cases detected in Vietnam and Indonesia. When examining cases globally, it's important to recognize that robust MPOX surveillance systems and vaccine implementation programs seldom exist outside of Europe, Canada, and the United States. Finally, when examining vaccine uptake, we can see that uptake slowed dramatically following the peak of the outbreak in July through September 2022. The graph highlights first and second doses administered since the beginning of the outbreak in May of 2022. First and second dose vaccine coverage is 38.8 and 24.3% respectively of the estimated at-risk people who are eligible for vaccination. Those at risk for MPOX are defined as HIV positive and PrEP eligible individuals, totaling an estimated 2 million persons in the United States. An incredible effort was put forth into achieving over 1.3 million doses administered. However, there is room for improvement. 93% of doses were administered in 2022, and although there was a shift from first to second doses this year, second dose coverage remains below one in four, and 37 out of 54 jurisdictions are still below these national coverage estimates, emphasizing the work needed to get at-risk people primary vaccination. 
As we move forward, a younger, unvaccinated population will also age into those eligible for primary vaccination. Next slide. We also saw a shift in vaccine administration sites from public health clinics to medical centers. This graph on the left displays the type of clinic and the percentage of, dose, percentage of doses administered with time periods in different shades of blue corresponding to peak outbreak, waning outbreak, and periods of low transmission, with the lightest color being the most recent uh, data from January to March of 2023. You can see that public health providers administered 40% of all vaccines through March of 2023. Medical care providers administered an increasing proportion of vaccines since the start of the outbreak. And pharmacies consistently provided 3 to 4% of all vaccines. Next slide. Looking closer at the types of medical center providers giving vaccine, we see that there were statistically significant increases in vaccines provided by primary care offices, federally qualifying health centers, and other health centers. Next slide. Now we will discuss a few models as it relates to vaccination in the current outbreak. Next slide. We want to discuss why vaccination is an important strategy to prevent ongoing cases. Here we show results from a model of MPOX transmission in Washington, D.C., where the model estimated cases averted by behavioral adaptation, vaccination, or both interventions. The black line here shows the estimated prevalent MPOX infections in D.C. over one year if no vaccines had been administered and if individuals had not adapted their behaviors in response to MPOX. Next slide. Surveys indicate that individuals reduced the number of sexual partners in response to MPOX. Thus, the red line shows the model estimates of prevalent infections if individuals had adapted their behavior. This scenario does not include vaccine administration. The model estimates that behavioral adaptation alone could have quickly flattened the curve, but not ended the outbreak within one year. Next slide. The blue line here shows that model estimates of prevalent infections with vaccination alone, based on vaccine administration records in DC. This scenario does not include behavioral adaptation. The model indicates that vaccination would have taken longer to have an effect than behavioral adaptation, but would have ended the outbreak within a year. Next slide. Finally, the purple line shows the model estimates of prevalent infections with vaccination and behavioral adaptation combined. The model estimates that combined, when combined, these two interventions averted 80% of potential MPOX cases in DC, with behavioral adaptations being key to averting cases early on and vaccination being key to ending the outbreak. Similar results were also found in, our, in models in other cities. Next slide. Models not only estimate that vaccination is key to ending the MPOX outbreak, but also that vaccination is key to preventing MPOX resurgence. Later in the outbreak in DC, the model estimated that nearly the entire high-risk population of MSM who engage in one-time sexual partnerships had gained full or partial immunity through vaccination or through acquiring and recovering from MPOX, making resurgence in DC unlikely. However, over time, population level immunity will decrease due to population turnover. Further, most U.S. jurisdictions had a lower vaccine coverage than D.C., potentially leaving them vulnerable to resurgence. This plot shows the probability that five infectious individuals in a population of MSM would cause a resurgent MPOX outbreak on the y-axis over various levels of immunity among individuals at increased risk for MPOX on the x-axis. For the purposes of this model, either one or two dose vaccination is used. However, we know that from VE data, two doses is greater. Here, we define that resurgent outbreak as continuous community transmission for at least three months. We see that the risk of recurrence decreases linearly as population level immunity increases. Next slide. While the probability of recurrence decreases linearly with population level immunity, the size of potential outbreaks has a more complex relationship with population level immunity. 
Here the y-axis now shows the predictive cumulative cases if an MPOX resurgence were to occur, compared to the number of cumulative cases in 2022 over the population level immunity on the x-axis. Next slide. This model estimates that resurgent outbreaks will be very small if the population level immunity is greater than 50%. Currently, only seven jurisdictions are above 50% of at least one dose Janeo's coverage among the high-risk population. Next slide. Now we will discuss vaccine effectiveness and safety updates. This data was presented uh, at previous ACIP meetings. This slide summarizes the available vaccine effectiveness data from three separate studies in the US, one from the Epic Cosmos, one from uh, multi-jurisdictional case control, and one from New York State. Next slide. On the top of the table, we can see that one dose VE ranges from 36% to 75%. Next slide. And on the bottom, VE ranges for, from 66 to 89% for two-dose vaccination. Consistently across the studies, we see that VE for two-dose vaccination is higher than one dose, emphasizing the importance of finishing the two-dose series. Next slide. Next, we wanted to present updated VE estimates from the multi-jurisdictional case control study that was performed in 12 US jurisdictions and initially presented in February. Here, cases were identified from a jurisdiction's list of MPOX cases, while controls were identified from healthcare settings providing HIV prep or STI clinics. VE here was adjusted for age, race and ethnicity, and immunocompromising conditions. It was stratified by route of administration and immunocompromised status. Next slide. Overall VE from partial or one dose vaccination is updated here to 73% with a confidence interval of 59 to 82, with similar results for those with either administration route. This estimate is similar to the previously reported 75%, but does have a smaller confidence interval. Next slide. Overall VE from two dose vaccination is updated to 83% with a confidence interval of 71 to 90. Again, with similar results with either administration route. These updated data suggest that the VE estimates are stable. Next slide. When we look at the updated VE estimates for self-reported immunocompromised individuals, the confidence intervals of the estimates no longer cross zero. However, it's important to note that the sample sizes are still small within this subset of individuals and have wide confidence intervals that range from 8 to 19 for one dose and 23 to 96 for two dose. The point estimates of self-reported immunocompromised status appear similar but non-significantly lower than that in self-reported immunocompetent individuals. Notably, as immunocompromised status was self-reported, it is hard to ascertain the accuracy of this measurement for those who are truly immunocompromised. For example, people living with well-controlled HIV with CD4 counts above 350 may have responded that they are immunocompromised. Overall, this data, albeit encouraging, needs to be interpreted carefully. And ultimately, what we need is more work dedicated to understanding what VE is in immunocompromised people. Next slide. CDC continues to monitor adverse events after Janeos using two surveillance systems, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, and the Vaccine Safety Data Link, or VSD. VSAFE data collection for MPOX vaccines was available from November 2022 to March 21st, 2023. Next slide. Approximately 90% of the reports were submitted during the calendar year 2022. There has been a relatively small amount of additional safety data accrued during 2023. And no new safety signals have been identified and no changes have been uh, since the previous ACIP presentations in February and June. The adverse events most commonly reported to VARES have been injection site symptoms such as redness, swelling, pain, and itching. Myocarditis and pericarditis are adverse events of special interest, and observed rates are consistent with the expected background rates. Next slide. 
VARES and VSD do not suggest an increased risk for myocarditis or pericarditis following Janeo's vaccination, but the possibility of a small risk cannot be excluded. The frequencies of local and systemic reactions reported to VSAFE after MPOX vaccine were similar to those reported in clinical trials. No new or unexpected safety concerns have been identified. Next slide. In summary, MPOX cases and deaths continue to be reported domestically and globally, but no longer at the same levels observed during 2022. There was an incredible effort into robust vaccine response, but we still have room for improvement. Less than a quarter of the eligible population is fully vaccinated with two doses. It is important to remember that with little vaccine implementation outside the United States, Canada, or Europe, uh, and with rising cases in East Asia and other regions, the outbreak is continuing. Modeling data suggests that without vaccination, transmission of MPOX will continue with sporadic outbreaks. No new safety signals have uh, been identified from VARES or VSD, and the VE appears stable for immunocompetent people. Next slide. I'd like to thank everyone who helped me in, in preparing these slides, and we can pause there for any questions. Thank you. This presentation is now open for questions. Uh, Dr. Paling. Um. So first of all, thank you for this great presentation. And I very much appreciated the data uh, um, demonstrating that both doses of Genios is important for the vaccine effectiveness um, in using multiple studies. And um, I also wanted to highlight that um, according to the uptake, it appears that about 63% of the population that starts the do the Genios dose actually finishes, which is really important. My question is in regard to the cases, we have eight cases of reinfection, which is extraordinarily low, and they seem to be much minor, much milder. Do we have any data on the extent of vaccination? In other words, did they receive one or both doses? Thank you. I believe in that case series specifically was a global case series. I think there was one individual who was vaccinated during that time period. And there are cases following reinfection that CDC is currently investigating, some of whom have uh, been vaccinated between their first and second uh, infection. However, the number here are really small and interpretation of this data is, can be challenging. Ms. Bata. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I might have to mute your computer. They're going to take my computer away. <laughs> um, the question that I have is um, related to the cases that followed vaccination and whether or not you had an opportunity to analyze the, um, the method of administration, ID versus sub-Q. That is something that we are looking to. Um, however, what we know from VE data is that there doesn't seem to be a difference in vaccine effectiveness from either administration route. Yeah, this is Agam Rao. Um, I'll just also chime in that we, we have looked to see if there was any pattern, for example, with the Chicago cluster, where there was a cluster of cases that occurred in May that was affecting a lot of people who were um, fully vaccinated. And there does not seem to be an association with those breakthrough infections and the route of administration. So we saw um, breakthrough infections that occurred among people who received two doses intradermal, two doses subcutaneous, and also one dose subcutaneous and one dose intradermal. Dermal. And um, actually, there were fewer that received two doses in redermal that were breakthrough cases from that cluster. And I think the national data also mirrors that same thing. Um, Sarah Guagliardo, do you want to, can you confirm or could you weigh in on that, whether the national data also is um, similar to what I just described? Sure. Uh, thank you, Agam. Yeah, so just to chime in and add to Agam's comments, um, 
We've taken a look at our national case surveillance data and also addressed uh, route of administration amongst these breakthrough infections that we've seen, and we have not seen any differences in severity between uh, uh, route of administration. And I think we're, we're that working it, on publishing that. But, yeah. Thank you. I, I, my biggest concern is more about the complexity of intradermal vaccination and how that might have impacted effectiveness, but it sounds like you're not seeing any patterns. Thank you so much. Dr. Cotton, please go ahead. Thanks, and thanks for all the excellent information you shared. Could you um, tell us more about studies that are underway looking at immunocompromised um, people? We know that they were really devastated by this and were among the deaths reported. Many of them were immunocompromised and also from underserved and other populations. Do you, is there more work underway? And if so, what's the time frame for getting that information? Thank you. Um, before uh, Fassel and uh, perhaps Dr. McCollum weigh in on that, this is Agam Rao again. I just wanted to say that it's true the deaths are absolutely predominantly occurring among people who have advanced HIV or some other form of immunocompromise, severe immunocompromise. Um, but uh, these are individuals who also did not receive any doses of the vaccine. And so um, um, while our VE estimate, as, as Dr. Minhaj just mentioned, is, is uh, problematic because we can't necessarily extrapolate a true VE estimate among immunocompromised people, um, uh, we also just don't know the effectiveness of the vaccine among individuals with that degree of severe immunocompromise. We do recognize this as an absolute priority, though. And um, if Dr. McCollum could just weigh in on some of the things that we've been thinking about. Um, uh, before she weighs in, though, I will say that like for our the multi-jurisdictional study, the data of which uh, Fassel showed, we are going to attempt to try to understand what the CD4 count and viral load was for those patients so that we can actually properly determine whether or not um, those are those are truly immunocompromised people. Um, uh, Dr. McCollum, is there anything else that you might want to add? No, thanks, Agam. I'll, I'll just add that we, um, I think, during through both the multi-jurisdictional study and looking at the case control set up for monitoring of VE, there are opportunities for monitoring. Again, it'll be a relatively smaller subset of those um, with well-defined immunocompromise or, or self-reported at this point in time immunocompromise. Uh, we're also uh, actively engaged in collaborating uh, on a longitudinal study out of UCLA looking at individuals presenting and receiving care at both HIV and sexual health clinics uh, in the area and follow monitoring them um, longer term um, for self-reported uh, and, and clinically defined health uh, events as well as um, some of the defined uh, risk factors, and, and that would also involve uh, blood um, collection for serology, so that would provide a nice additional sort of laboratory component as we're looking at this. Um, and then we've certainly been talking to potential collaborators outside of the United States, more of in the endemic regions, and, and looking at these populations specifically as well um, to ensure that we're thinking broadly um, about the scope of data that, that could be collected. So I think it's an ongoing story. I agree with Agam and, and others that this is certainly um, a top priority to better understand um, the impact and um, potential necessitation for vaccine use in these populations. Thank, thank you, you very Dr. Much. Middleman. Oh, sorry, Grace, can I just Hi. continue? It's Camille. Um, thank you very much for that. And it's certainly very important to look at this in people with advanced HIV. I would also encourage you to look outside of um, that population as an estimated 3% of the US population is immunocompromised. And so it um, should be both uh, advanced HIV, but also beyond that, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Middleman, did you wish to make yeah. a comment? Yes. Hi, it's Amy Middleman from SAM. I just I just want to make sure I understand the recommendation. It's so important that this vaccine get to the right people. Gender identity and sexual attraction descriptions do not necessarily translate into um, behaviors. And so um, in reading the recommendation, it, and 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 I also so this is also an epidemiology question, my assumption and again, it could be wrong, is that what the behavior that really puts people at risk is receptive anal intercourse. Perhaps it's not just receptive anal intercourse, but also um, 
uh, anal intercourse in general, the first line of the recommendation is confusing and will confuse a lot of people because it it really is mixing up gender identity terminology with sexual attraction terminology, which does not translate into behavior. So it would be really helpful, I think, if these recommendations actually stated what the risk behavior is. Um, and I mean, a tr I don't believe a transgender male unless they're engaging in receptive intercourse. Uh, so someone assigned female at birth who's now a trans male would be in the risk category, unless I'm reading that incorrectly. So I, I understand why it is difficult, but I do think we need to start identifying the behaviors that put people at risk so that we can protect everyone who requires protection. Thank you. Thank you for those excellent comments, Dr. Middleman. Um, really appreciate that. Dr. Freihofer, I'm gonna keep moving on and then uh, let's come back to that when the, rec when the vote slide comes up, please. Dr. Freihofer. Uh, Sandra Freihofer, Amer American Medical Association. Uh, this, thank you so much for this presentation. The safety information was very reassuring, but we knew, we previously had, had uh, a contraindication on giving uh, this vaccine with COVID vaccines. Can you comment about that a little bit more and how you came to that decision? About um, maybe I could answer this. This is Agam Rao again. Um, since I was involved in doing that. So it's not a contraindication. It's just like a co-administration sort of guidance. So this is actually posted on the, the CDC COVID-19 interim clinical considerations, and it's also posted to the interim clinical considerations for our MPOX vaccine. Um, and and, and um, I will actually discuss that a little bit more in the last presentation on this slide deck. Um, but I, I just want to say that it's not a contraindication or a precaution. It's just something um, that people might, might keep in mind until we have um, data that can absolutely rule out even the smallest chance of myocarditis being potentiated um, after the COVID-19 vaccine and the Genios vaccine are given together. So we've not seen any safety signals that would suggest that the Genios vaccine is associated with myopericarditis, but because ACAM 2000, the other orthopox virus vaccine is, um, there's a definite signal there and we don't understand the mechanism. We just um, included that as a, you know, in case there is, and the data so far does not support that, but, but we can't rule out at this time the very smallest chance that there is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to your presentation, Dr. Rao, Evidence to Recommendations Framework, Vaccination with Genios for Persons at Risk of MPOX. Okay, thanks very much. And as you can tell, I'm uh, recovering from an illness. So I apologize for my hoarse voice. Okay, so the Evidence to Recommendations Framework, or ETR, is a structure to describe information considered in moving from evidence to ACIP vaccine recommendations. It provides transparency around the impact of additional factors on deliberations when considering a recommendation. So the ETR, um, the work group's ETR question was, does ACIP recommend vaccination with the two-dose Genios vaccine series for persons aged 18 years and older at risk for MPOX? The two-dose Genios series we're referring to is one where the second dose is administered about 28 days after the first dose. Um, persons at risk, it's defined as, um, as the following. You've already seen this in um, Dr. Sanchez's presentation, so I'll say it again this time, but then in the future, I, uh, I won't read that portion. Um, gays, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, transgender, or non-binary people who in the past six months have had one of the following, a new diagnosis of greater than or equal to one sexually transmitted disease, more than one sex partner, sex at a commercial sex venue, sex in association with a large public event in a geographic area where MPOX transmission is occurring. And by this, we're referring um, partly to the fact that there's a lot of people who are traveling abroad, for example, Cayman Islands, wherever else. Um, that's, that's when we first saw that this outbreak um, took off last year. And um, if they're traveling to such areas, um, and they know that there is MPOX in those areas or people who are traveling from MPOX areas are traveling there and they're going to be interacting with them and they would also be eligible. Um, I understand Dr. Um, one of the, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Middleman's comment, and we can talk more about that later. Our um, CDC STD experts 
um, were also involved in the development of this language. And so perhaps one of them can speak to this during the Q&A session, exactly why this specific wording was chosen. And it is identical to the wording um, that's been used throughout this particular outbreak response. Um, the second um, bullet, the sub bullet here refers to sexual partners of persons with the risks described in the above. And what this means is that heterosexual women, for example, who has sex with bisexual men would also be eligible for the vaccine. And then finally, anyone who anticipates experiencing any of the above risks um, is also someone who could be vaccinated. So they can simply, att sim simply attest to the fact that they feel that they are at risk and can receive the vaccine um, because of this last sub bullet. Importantly, this ETR question is referring to vaccination before an exposure or pre-exposure vaccination. So that's what we're proposing as a vote. And that's what all of our presentation slides are referring to. They're referring to vaccination before an exposure. So the PICO question is shown on this slide deck. It is, should the two-dose Genios vaccine series be recommended for persons aged 18 years and older at risk for MPOX? 18 years and older was chosen because as Dr. Sanchez mentioned in his introduction, the Genius vaccine is currently only licensed for persons 18 years and, old, uh, years and older. But there is an NIH trial that's underway to study the safety and immunogenicity of Genius in persons 12 to 17, 17 years of age. And when that data is available, the work group will review that data and, and possibly bring it to ACIP. The intervention is um, in this PICO question is vaccination with Genios. And importantly, the comparator is no vaccination. So when we go through the ETR domains, we're referring to um, the vaccination versus no vaccination. This slide shows the ETR domains that the ACIP members are all uh, familiar with. Uh, public health problem, benefits and harms, values, acceptability, equity, feasibility, and resource use. I will present the work group interpretation of the data for each of these domains and the response to the questions that are listed on this slide um, on the, um, in the second column. So first, the public health problem. MPOX cases continue to occur domestically and internationally, including in clusters, but also in, in, in cases that we cannot connect to clusters. There's also severe disease, disease and deaths that continue to occur as well. Um, over 1.25 million doses of Genios have been administered in the United States, which is really great. It took a lot of effort for that to happen. However, national vaccine coverage remains lower than ideal, possibly because of lower perceived risk of MPOX in the last six months. As, as Dr. Minhaj presented, CDC modeling data suggests that larger outbreaks may occur if vaccine coverage remains less than 50% nationally for persons at risk for MPOX, and it is currently only about 23 to 24%, so one in four people um, who should be vaccinated are vaccinated at this time. And, and again, just to reiterate that severe disease um, and deaths are continuing to occur uh, predominantly among, un I mean, among unvaccinated people, to our knowledge. Uh, moving on to benefits and harms. So there are three main sources of VE data, as Dr. Minhaj has already mentioned, a CDC EPIC study, a CDC multi-jurisdictional study, and a New York State study. So the methodology of these studies and the data from them was presented during the two previous ACIP meetings and also a little bit in the previous presentation. But to recap, the two doses of the Genio series was found to be better than one dose. And the estimated VE for preventing MPOX disease is 66 to 89% for the two dose vaccine series. The CDC multi-jurisdictional study is continuing to collect data. And um, to our knowledge is perhaps the only source of data that will be continued uh, worldwide. We're attempting to estimate the VE for preventing infections among immunocompetent versus immunocompromised persons, as Dr. McCollum has already mentioned. So hopefully we'll have more information, but we certainly recognize that this is a major gap in our understanding. Okay, so ACIP previously recommended use of the Genio uh, vaccine series, the Tudo series, for two populations, populations at inc increased risk of occupational exposure to orthopox viruses and persons at risk for MPOX during MPOX outbreaks. At that time, ACIP reviewed the grade data and the available VE data, and now 
we just we have more VE data that's basically supporting the same thing. So um, in response to this question of how substantial are the desirable anticipated effects, the work group answered large. Similarly, there are no new safety concerns since the previous ACIP votes about use of genios. The adverse events most commonly reported to VAERS have been injection site symptoms such as redness, swelling, pain, and itching. The work group interpreted these as small, undesirable, anticipated effects. And then because the desirable anticipated effects are large and the undesirable anticipated effects are small, the work group felt the intervention, which again is vaccination with genials compared to no vaccination, is favored. And now to, um, this is the, the subsequent data is about how the affected population feels or felt the vaccine throughout the outbreak. Um, I know, um, we are running a little bit short of time, but so I'm gonna to try to convey some of this information a little bit more succinctly than maybe the slides uh, show. But early in our MPOX outbreak response, there's been multiple national surveys that have indicated that there was strong interest in the Genios vaccine. And this data was presented in detail during the February ACIP meeting. But to summarize, during August to November, 2022, greater than 85% of respondents in the American Transformative HIV study or amethyst study were interested in the vaccine. And then during August to December, 50% of Porter Novelli survey responders who identified as LGBTQ uh, plus felt the vaccination was important to protect from MPOX. During October to November 2022, greater than 70% of MSM in a San Francisco survey of persons experiencing homelessness reported that they too would accept or have accepted the vaccine. During October to December 2022, an American Men's Interest Survey, or AMOS, showed that those who were concerned about MPOX were 3.5 times more likely um, to be vaccinated. So um, early in the response, in addition to this information that I showed in this slide, in this, in this slide um, we also obtained information, for, uh, other information. So first off, uh, persons seeking vaccination, um, obviously not a surprise, but those individuals were interested in the vaccine. One of those study surveys was performed during a study called the DC PEP++ study, which is a CDC and DC health collaboration that followed a cohort of persons at elevated risk of MPOX exposure in Washington, DC, who presented for vaccination. And 866 adult were, adults were surveyed, greater than 85% agreed or strongly agreed that vaccines for MPOX should be available to anyone who wants the vaccine and 82% said that they were likely or very likely to even get a third dose if it was recommended. It's not recommended, but they were even willing to get a third dose. And then another evaluation, which is shown in this second major bullet, also done in Washington, D.C. around the same time period, supported the same idea. So, however, also early in the response, there's been studies that show that um, some conflicting feelings among, among the people who are recommended to be vaccinated. A survey was performed by Curtis et al. among 320 persons, primarily MSM, living in Illinois and at risk for MPOX. 24.1% had received two vaccine doses, 27.5% had received one dose, um, and 47.5% no doses. Persons who are vaccinated were more likely to have higher education, known someone with MPOX, express concern about their safety, and to be less likely to report um, recent food insecurity. The Turpin study listed in the second bullet um, also um, uh, evaluated this. Qualitative interviews were performed with 24 Black MSM attending HIV prevention-related activities in the greater D.C. area, so a very important population. This was early in the MPOX response, May of 2022, and at that time, there wasn't as much availability of the MPOX vaccine as there is now. Now there's enough vaccine to definitely vaccinate all of the people subcutaneously who are recommended to receive the vaccine. But at that time, a common concern was um, the lack of availability of the MPOX vaccine, which implies interest in the vaccine. And vaccine hesitancy was also expressed, but possibly similar to uh, vaccine hesitancy reported for um, other vaccines. Uh, so moving on to more recently, in June of 2023, CDC issued a state of vaccine confidence report 
A month prior to issuing that report, um, in May of 2023, I mentioned that an MPOX cluster was identified in Chicago, predominantly affecting many people who received two doses of the Genios vaccine. And so this Vaccine Competence Insights report was intended to review MPOX-related discussions on 23 news and social media outlets in the Chicago area so that we could understand the sentiments of the affected population um, and, and develop communication um, um, material accordingly. So MPOX vaccine hesitancy among the general public and LGBTQ affiliated groups was noted and people questioned um, uh, the effectiveness of the safety of the vaccine and expressed distrust in national reporting. However, um, when we went back and actually interviewed the patients who were impacted by that outbreak, 18 of those patients agreed to an interview and they were uh, a company, uh, they were people who were fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, and unvaccinated, and they actually indicated support for the vaccination. So although chatter, I guess, online chatter indicated that there was some skepticism, the actual patients affected by that outbreak were supportive of the vaccine. Most stated that they would recommend vaccine to others. Some assumed that any some assumed that any MPOX infection would have been pre uh, prevented by the vaccine, but they still felt that the vaccine was effective in reducing the severity. And unvaccinated persons said that they had not been vaccinated because they'd attempted to early on in the response, and then the supply was limited at the time. And then once they were able to, um, once they once it was available, they they thought that since case counts had decreased that the risk was very low and they didn't end up seeking it. Oops, you guys skipped. Okay. Um, and then uh, extremely recently in June, so just a few months ago, CDC performed an online focus group for 52 people to help develop CDC communication material. And participants were included if they identified as men, were unvaccinated for MPOX, never diagnosed with MPOX, were 18 to 45 years of age and had sex with two or more men with, uh, within the past six months. So essentially people who were eligible for the MPOX vaccine. And the participants were intentionally of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds and were shown various communication materials in development by, by CDC. Um, exposure to the information about MPOX vaccine safety, effectiveness, and hearing that there is a current threat of MPOX affected their interests. So although some of the individuals came to um, this focus group not interested in the vaccine or ambivalent about the vaccine, um, that changed. And um, many people disinterested in the vaccine became interested. They actually said that the current risk of MPOX and protecting their community was motivating. Oh. Um, okay, okay, good. All right, so uh, to summarize, vaccine demand was high early in the outbreak response when case counts were high. National surveys and interviews early and later in the outbreak indicate that overall interest in the Genios vaccinations um, is, is, is um, overall there was interest in the Genios vaccinations, but like with any vaccine, some people experience vaccine hesitancy. In response to whether the target population feels that the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects, the work group answered probably yes. Now, because interest and intent to get vaccinated varied among the infected population and a perceived lower risk of MPOX may be contributed to reduced interest in the vaccine, the work group felt that there was possibly important uncertainty or variability in how much people value main outcomes. So um, next I'll present about acceptability. So we know that health departments are supportive of the vaccine. Health departments requested a lot of the Genios vaccine, which you can see from the screenshot on the right side of the screen. They also organized vaccination campaigns as, um, as shown in the screenshot to the left. An online survey also early on showed that clinicians during July, August, and September were interested in getting their patients vaccinated. 69% felt the U.S. didn't have enough MPOX vaccines to handle the outbreak at that point. A few weeks later, on September 12th, 2022, a survey showed that 66% had treated at least one MPOX patient, and 76% um, knew where a patient could get the Genios vaccine, and 86% wanted to be able to actually provide the vaccine in their offices. So more recent data. Um, was via a Porter Novelli, uh, 
Porter Novelli survey of pediatricians and family practice practitioners. So approximately 100 people in each group that was performed in August of this year. So just a few months ago. And um, there were basically three MPOX vaccine questions added to a survey on pediatric COVID-19 vaccine attitudes and behaviors. And um, the, the responders were people who treated uh, children. So 85% of FP and 88% of pediatricians care for children 12 to 17 years of age, 70% of FP and 60% of pediatricians cared for patients greater than 18 years of age, 54% were part of large practices, and a majority were in private practice, but 14% practiced in federally qualified health centers. So hopefully a, a diverse group from, um, um, and the data is helpful for us to understand um, themes in general. Okay. So when asked whether they would prefer to provide the MPOX vaccine within their practice, um, FP, shown in the red bars on this chart, more often strongly or somewhat preferred providing the vaccine within their own practice. Pediatricians, whose response is shown in these blue arrows, while they were supportive of the vaccine, were preferred to refer to an outside practice. And Dr. Minhaj has already shown this information, but I just wanted to uh, remind um, the viewers that we've, we've seen over time a shift in vaccine administration from public health providers or clinics to medical care centers. So with this recommendation, if, if ACIP votes in favor of it, more vaccines would be provided in medical, medical, um, in medical centers, but that's already um, been happening. And you can see again on this slide that there is a statistically significant increase in vaccines provided by primary care offices, FQHCs, and other health centers, indicating that providers in these settings deem the vaccine acceptable. Um, and now we have um, CDC has done a recent online focus group performed with healthcare providers to further understand um, their thoughts, their knowledge, attitudes, and practices related to MPOX. And is uh, recruitment was via an external recruiting firm, a diverse group of participants, 41 participants. Um, I'll skip the rest of the slide just because I think you um, understand and I know we're short on time. The response from the healthcare providers who were part of this um, was supportive of, um, of the vaccine. So 68% had never managed an MPOX case. 34% uh, however believed MPOX is a threat to public health and 32% reported MPOX is important to their patient populations. 51% believe that MPOX services should be integrated into standard care, so that includes vaccines, for the following reason. It might increase access to the vaccine, it might improve education and awareness about MPOX for patients, and it would ensure comprehensive STI screening and testing. So in response to the question, um, is the intervention acceptable key stakeholders? The work group felt the answer was yes. Health departments and clinicians are supportive of MPOX vaccines, even if pediatricians would prefer to refer patients to other clinics to receive it. Family practitioners would like to be able to actually provide the Genios vaccine in their own clinics. And there's been a shift from Genios provided by public health providers to Genios provided by medical center providers, including STI and HIV clinics, where we think um, these vaccines will be administered if this recommendation is passed. Okay, so then moving on to resource use. Um, currently the vaccine is provided through national government stockpiles, through, through the strategic national stockpile, which is intended to stockpile therapeutics for bioterrorism, preparedness, and other similar um, you know, preparedness issues. So Genios has actually has been stockpiled for smallpox pro, uh, preparedness, but it was provided uh, during this response since it is not commercially available. Uh, the doses would need to be replenished and it's um, and it has been, it will continue to be a significant use of resources, for example, shipments and transportation, personnel monitoring all of this during the peak of this outbreak. And, and that would have to continue um, and be a further drain on the SNS or the strategic national stockpile should this vote be passed. But in the future, um, it's possible that the vaccine will be commercialized. And if so, there are unknown costs that will be associated with that. So the work group answered that it's unknown whether the intervention is a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. And now moving on to equity. 
Um, the work group interpreted this as trying to understand the population who was impacted by MPOX and felt that there, uh, there's a disproportionate impact of MPOX on gay, bisexual, and other MSM, Black, and Hispanic persons, persons experiencing homelessness. And so any vaccine administered versus no vaccine administered may decrease the disparity between the affected population and others. Um, the recommendation would facilitate one-to-one -one counseling and information sharing in the privacy of a clinic. If your clinician recommends the vaccine, a patient might be more likely to receive the vaccine. And during September 2023, so just last month, $5 million were allocated to community-based organizations or CBOs to advance MPOX prevention and vaccination efforts. We know that CBOs have played a critical role in this, um, in this MPOX response so far, and that they're essential to increasing vaccination coverage among those at risk. So far, 42 CBOs are funded um, with these $5 million. If the vaccine is commercialized, there may be an impact on primary sites of vaccination and on health departments, but at this point, it would be conjecture for us to know what exactly the impact would be. And um, as we previously mentioned, we would, uh, uh, in about two to three years, reassess um, this interim recommendation, um, knowing the situation at that time, not just epidemiology, but also depending on whether it's commercialized to uh, reassess this ETR. But until then, the recommendation might facilitate broad acceptance of the vaccination because everybody knows that um, that ACIP has a high bar for recommending something. And um, it, it, if it is commercialized in that interim time period, then uh, it would facilitate um, um, insurance companies also covering the vaccine. Um, so in response to the, the question about what would be the impact on health equity, um, the work group felt that access to vaccine versus no vaccine may improve the health of persons who are at risk for MPOX and that a routine recommendation may facilitate vaccinations. And so they answered it would probably be increased. Now, moving on to uh, feasibility, which is the last domain. Um, so it would continue to be provided, the Genios vaccine, via the Strategic National Stockpile or the SNS, free of cost to patients and providers. But we, as we mentioned, there is a cost overall to the U.S. government, but there would not be a cost to patients and providers. MPOX provider agreements, we have confirmed, do not have a termination date, and they will actually continue as long as the vaccine is acquired via the U.S. government program and can include new providers. In fact, we actually learned that um, health departments are continuing to bring on new providers. As uh, we heard, North Carolina, for example, recently just just did this. They've continued to do this throughout the outbreak response. The funding that I mentioned, the $5 million, has been provided to CBOs and may improve feasibility in addition to equity. Um, those CBOs obviously reach uh, hard to reach uh, uh, communities, um, and they also might uh, facilitate feasibility for those hard to reach communities. And if it's commercialized, though, and again, we're uncertain if, if or when it would be commercialized. Um, we have colleagues from Bavaria Nordic who will speak during the Q&A session and, and give a, a short statement. But if it is commercialized, it's um, it would be via Medicare and Medicaid and commercial plans without a copay. Uninsured would be given it uh, via Vaccines for Children program. And then some uninsured and underinsured adults um, could have difficulty, but that would be similar to the difficulty that people have with other vaccines. And, and it would be premature at this time to without knowing if it'll be commercialized to say that much more in the ETR presentation. So regarding whether the intervention is feasible to implement, um, the work group felt subcutaneous is what we're recommending. That is easy to administer. Uh, providers know how to give that vaccine. Standing orders are available. Genios can be stored refrigerated for eight weeks. There has been that recent shift in vaccine providers. Um, two individual clinics that dem demonstrates the continued successful integration of Genios into providers' practices. STI and HIV clinics and most family medicine and internal medicine providers seem to be comfortable providing vaccines, even if some pediatricians may refer uh, patients out to other clinics. And if commercialized, similar to other vaccines, the cost of vaccine might impact access to some populations. And so the answer for this uh, domain, um, is the intervention feasible to implement was yes, yeah, probably yes. 
So this slide just summarizes all the answers that we provided so far to the ETR domains. And in green, you can um, consider the things in green as, as favorable, green favorable. And in, in red is, is, um, is uncertainty, honestly. We don't really have anything that is clearly unfavorable, but because there's uncertainty uh, pertaining to uh, people's, the variability and values that people have about the vaccine in general, possibly because of um, what they are perceiving as a decreased risk, which we know is not the case. And also because we're uncertain about the commercialization, there is some uncertainty here. And, um, the work group answered that the desirable consequences probably outweigh the undesirable consequences in most settings. I will say though that the there were several work group members who felt that there was enough information presented here that indicated that the desirable consequences clearly outweigh the undesirable consequences despite the uncertainty, but because more people in a straw poll um, supported um, the probably outweigh option, um, that is what is shown in this slide. And then this recommendation again is uh, the recommendation that we would pr uh, propose for a vote and uh, would be interested in um, ACIP members input on the language in this vote and perhaps our STD colleagues at CDC could also weigh in on the specific language um, since there was a lot of uh, discussion about that, that language. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And I wanna thank all the people on the slide. Thank you, Dr. Al. Um, if you could please put back up the vote slide, that would be helpful. I'm going to ask our members if they have any questions and we'll try and focus in on the vote language. Dr. Paling. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Rao and your entire committee. That was a fantastic presentation. And um, uh, it, it, you, thank you for the reminder that this outbreak began in 2022, so this is less than two years into it. And so um, we have learned a lot and demonstrated the impacts Genios has had on the outbreak, um, but also the opportunity to move forward. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight was um, I really appreciated the teams working with patients that, and um, persons that were directly impacted to co-create the educational materials. I think that is so important and really just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I um, appreciate the questions that was raised about the verbiage, but the real question for me is the, the recommendation, which is the one sentence on the top. And for that, I think there is overwhelming evidence that this would be beneficial. And so I'd like to make a motion to prove the language as is. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Billings. Um, I realize now we have a motion on the table. Um, I, I'm gonna call on the next person, uh, Ms. Bata. Okay, I'll, I'll second that motion. <laughs> um, but I do have a couple comments as well. <clears throat> um, one comment and then one question. Um, I think it's really important as we talk about the, the launching of uh, new vaccines as well as transitioning from um, federal supply to commercial supply that there will be decreased access. And, and so I can't emphasize as um, maybe not as much as uh, Dr. Talbot, but we really need a, a vaccines for adults program. And then the other question I have is uh, as we move into a possible routine um, recommendation for MPOX, What's our supply look like? Um, we're seeing. Um, yeah, I will start, but I will. Dr. Um, David Boucher from HHS is actually going to give a little bit of a statement. And so perhaps he could speak a little bit more to that when he gives his statement. I'll just say that there's there's a lot of vaccine. Definitely all of the people who are eligible for the vaccine over the next several years, including people who enter this um, become eligible in income, you know, people become of age or, or whatever during that time period, there's plenty of vaccine. Um, but I will ask Dr. Boucher, I don't know, um, Dr. Lee, if you want Dr. Boucher to give his comment now, but 
Um, um, actually, let's go through the questions, okay. but um, if there are specific questions for Dr. Boucher, uh, that would be uh, wonderful to save those um, or bring them up and we can make sure we can respond then. Uh, Dr. Daly. Um, yeah, I'm also in support of the proposed recommendation. A quick question, Dr. Rao, can you remind us about duration of immunity from vaccination? Just, sorry, duration of protection from vaccination. Thanks. Yeah, and, and this is actually something that we are we are hoping to continue to evaluate through continuing VE work. I mean, again, to my knowledge, the multi-jurisdictional study is the only uh, one out of those three studies that will be continuing, perhaps um, perhaps the New York State one also will be continuing, but, but this is clearly a very important question. Um, I'll, I'll say what we know so far is that, that pre-licensure data indicated that an anamnestic response to the vaccine occurs um, up to two years after uh, the primary two-dose series. And really the only reason uh, we proposed um, for persons at occupational risk for orthopedic viruses, a booster frequency of two years was that nobody had evaluated a time point later than two years. Um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, CDC has a vaccine study and we um, are looking into this. It appears that people have um, mounted in a, a, um, a robust response after five years after the initial primary dose series, but we want to evaluate that a little bit more before we can confidently express that. Um, Dr. McCollum and Dr. Paniampali, since you lead that work, I wonder if you could add anything to what I said about the DRC work. Um, yeah, thank you, Agam. <clears throat> to add, so we have looked at the immune response in vaccines. Uh, we had like some, some we classify as naive, so they have never received the vaccination before. And those who have been previously vaccinated as a childhood. So even after like several decades, people who received childhood vaccination, they demonstrate a robust uh, anamnestic response. So we, then we also looked at so those uh, individuals probably received like replicating vaccine previously. Uh, Genius is a non-replicating vaccine. So we also wanted to see if Genius has like a similar effect. So um, as uh, Dr. Rao mentioned, five years after people who received Genius, irrespective of whether we detect any circulating antibodies or not, uh, seven days after a boost, we see a robust increase in the immune response. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's go on to Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. And just want to thank again Faisal and Agam for really their incredible journey to, from um, you know, to hopefully a recommendation for this vaccine. But I, I was wondering. My question is: Do we have a cost for this vaccine? Do we know how much it'll cost? And, Um, uh, I agree. Dr. Lee, I don't know if there are uh, not two colleagues from Bavaria Nordic on the call, but they too are planning on making a statement. So perhaps that'll be included in their statement. That's fine. Why don't we bundle it till then? But uh, please uh, do ask the question if it doesn't get answered. Um, so Dr. Sanchez, any other questions? I'm trying to run through as quickly as possible. No, that was, okay. that was all. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Sineas. Yes, thank you. Can you comment on a timeline for recommendation for adolescent patients who um, at risk? Yes, yeah, so um, the reason we proposed the 18 and older was because this vaccine is licensed for that population. And we know that we're gonna have NIH data from that trial for 12 to 17 year olds, hopefully in 2024. And so it did not make sense to propose for an ACIP vote when we know that there's already data, that, that there's data in progress um, and data in progress soon. Um, so it's clinical guidance that we would uh, propose for those persons until we can um, come back to ACIP with um, with information about uh, from that NIH trial. And I will explain that clinical guidance data in my next presentation. Thank you, Dr. This Zahn. is John Beigel from the NIH, just oh. to, to add some timelines. So that's that adolescent stage uh, was fully enrolled in September of this year, which means the peak immunogenicity visits actually just happened uh, a few days ago, a day 42 visit. Um, so that the, 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 it is designed to be a year follow-up. Uh, so that puts us to October 
of 2024 for the full data set. You know, we can discuss with ACIP and, and with uh, Bavarian Nordic about uh, early looks, but to actually see the full data set, it is that the, the visits will be October 2024, 20, uh, which means the data will be sometime after that. Thank you, Dr. Beigel. Dr. Zahn? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lee. And thank you, Dr. Rao, for, for the great presentation. You know, Agam, as I'm, I'm sure you were well aware, in the state of California, we have had the recommendation uh, that it is basically simplified, which is to say that if you have HIV, uh, if you uh, uh, are practicing MSM, you are recommended to receive the vaccine. Um, and maybe, you know, probably our decision making is affected by the fact in California, we've always seen a relatively high burden of cases. But I must say that I've been a big fan of that simpler recommendation. I think our concerns that any individual in the community, uh, you know, this is not simple recommendation, you know, to think through and, you know, and decide to cure risk. I mean, it's not like it can't be done, but it certainly could be a lot simpler. And uh, our concern that either persons who are at risk would not, you know, recognize they're at risk, or if they go to a healthcare setting, depending on the setting, is the provider going to be comfortable uh, or have the time to go all th through all of these, you know, potential risk factors and, and talk them through the pluses and minuses, and then you know the potential stigma associated with it. You know, if you're if you're deciding, you know, you're coming in to present, you know, it's because you know because you practice certain risk factors, and so. Uh, in California, we've had a broader guidance. I think it's been much simpler for us to message uh, than, it, than it would have been otherwise. Um, we're not at the point where we're having huge amounts of uptake so that, you know, this hasn't led to a, you know, a stampede to get an enormous amount of vaccine. And um, I would be disappointed if we were not able to continue uh, with that broader recommendation, particularly in California, because you know certainly we're seeing that you know we continue to see as as you know not huge numbers, but certainly sporadic disease, and uh, certainly in southern and northern California. That'd be one comment. I guess the other comment is I, I, I certainly appreciate your point that it's hard to know exactly how it's going to work out when vaccination is commercialized, but this is a vaccine that, in particular, uh, high risk. Uh, patient populations in the community exist, which mean that outreach to specific community settings is really, you know, has proven to be valuable, will be continuing to be valuable. To, so to have the continued support to our CBO partners and to public health to be able to provide that outreach over time, I think is gonna be really, really important. So thanks for the time. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Zahn. You make a really good point, uh, your second point. Um, it, is, it is going to be very important to continue to be able to support um, CBOs because they do very important work, and particularly for this population, their work is critical. Um, regarding your first comment, um, I wonder if one of our colleagues from the Laura, Dr. Laura Quilter, she has thoughts about this, but before she speaks, I just want to say that um, we did put thought into whether it could be simplified, and the thought was that it, we this is uh, this is um, an infection that is that occurs when you have certain um, behavior risk factors. And so to say anyone who has HIV, anyone who is MSM um, is perhaps giving the vaccines to people who don't need the vaccine and might all might might be concerned about getting the vaccine even though they're monogamous relationships they you know don't have, or they don't you know any they don't meet the criteria um and and that that was part of the reasons that um it was it was like it was made much narrower but i wonder dr quilter or dr um spicknall if you have any thoughts about this uh, and and the, and the wording of uh, the population Hey, Agam. Um, this is Laura Coulter from the Division of STD Prevention. I would just echo what you said um, that, you know, I think we were trying, trying to strike a balance. Um, um, I appreciate um, the comments on, you know, wanting to avoid stigma, wanting to simplify things for providers, but also wanting to really um, ensure that the vaccination um, is is going to folks that are at the, the most risk for, for MPOX exposure. And so this was even tweaked from, I think, an even more complicated version first time around. And so I think it, it's challenging, you know, to strike that balance. I agree with what Agam was mentioning. 
Thank you, Dr. Spicknell, and, and or, sorry, Dr. Quilter and Dr. Spicknell. I don't know if you, as a modeling expert in the division of STD prevention at CDC, have any thoughts about just how much bigger the population would be if um, if it was referring to all MSM or all people with HIV versus what it's described as on this slide. But um, in case you do, do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, in terms of. Uh, a larger population, we would be going from roughly 2 million to 4 to 6 million people. So we would be enlarging the scope greatly. And like what was what has been said to folks who may not benefit from this sort of vaccine for, for reasons you described a bit ago. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree with what's been said. Thank you. And um, just uh, I want to make sure Dr. Middleman's comments as we start to think down towards the 12 year olds and future recommendations. Uh, Dr. Middleman, I don't know, looking at this full set of recommendations, I, I believe this addresses it, but if uh, you don't think so, please let us know. Dr. Dries. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, I missed the very beginning of this session due to another commitment, so I apologize if this was already raised, but um, in this list of people who are at risk for MPOX on the slide, it does not mention occupational exposures, which I guess you know I know are limited to laboratory workers working with orthopox viruses. But is that intentional? Is that going to be a separate decision, or is that intended to be included in this vote? Thank you. Yeah, it's intentional that it's not included in this vote, and I'll um, explain that a little bit more in my in my next slide deck. I'll just say that this is intended to be pre-exposure prophylaxis. For the population currently um, acquiring MPOX during the current outbreak. And the fact that there are already standing recommendations for persons, occupational of persons, not just health, not just um, laboratorians, but also healthcare personnel. Um, there was a vote during February uh, of, during an outbreak who needs to be vaccinated. And there, uh, because there's been so few healthcare associated infections acquired. Um, it's not routinely recommended um, uh, for, for clinicians who are providing care to a patient with MPOX or somebody who might have MPOX. Um, and the laboratorians, of course, we're still in the midst of an outbreak and, and many laboratorians have been vaccinated and they can continue to be vaccinated. But it's intentional that this vote is limited to this population because the outbreak recommendations would otherwise apply to others. Okay, thank you. And I just wanted to make a comment wearing my other hat as a practicing HIV provider that, you know, our state also allows anyone with HIV to be vaccinated, but um, I do agree with these uh, risk factors as listed below. You know, we do have a lot of vaccines that we have to talk about with our population. And so I, I do not routinely offer it to, to every, every person living with HIV because many of them I know are not really at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Middleman. Um, hi, I just want to make sure then that I understand the recommendation um, and that I also understand the risk factor and risk behavior because we talked about behavior adaptation in the epidemiology slide, but I wasn't sure what that behavioral adaptation was that was implemented to decrease transmission. So I'm assuming it was condom use, but I don't know. Um, so is the risk factor receptive anal intercourse? And is this first line of people at risk intended to include transgender males and all non-binary people? Yes. Uh, yes, they have the risk factor. So if you look at the, the first, in the footnote here, the first major bullet, then it says, we're referring to men of sex with men, transgender, non-binary people who in the past six months, so then the sub-bullets are um, uh, you know, only if they've I, had one of the following. I understand, but why transgender males and why non-binary people? Oh, okay. Uh, Dr. Quilter, can I, um, can I ask you to answer that question? Yeah. Um, so the population of persons at increased risk here um, is based on gender identity and sexual orientation, but in addition to these additional factors um, that can increase the uh, potential for risk for MPOX, um, which we know, you know, from STI and HIV is increased um, risk of sexual transmission. But um, why transgender males? They're assigned female at birth. So are you, I I'm confused. It's uh, not just risk, receptive. What is the risk factor? Is the risk factor receptive anal intercourse? I don't think we know enough yet to specifically yeah. specify a behavior and be postal site of infection. Though we know that based on how MPOX is transmitted through intimate or sexual contact, you know, it could be any skin to skin 
uh, contact with mucosal infections. It's possible, you know, through oral sex, through insertive or receptive anal intersex. I don't think at this time we have enough data to say that one more so than the other is the primary um, behavior or mucosal side of exposure that puts an individual at risk for mpox infection. And we're assuming then that there is something different about transgender males and non-binary people that puts them at higher risk. Is that, am I well, there have been cases that correctly? Identified. There have been cases, based on the RFB data, there have been cases identified among trans and non-binary people. Um, but haven't there also been cases among heteros? I just, I'm just very curious about the data. Like, is there something different about the rates found among those populations? I believe there were studies looking on, sorry, Alvin, were you about to say something? Like, I was I was actually going to see if um, Dr. Sarah Guagliardo wants to add anything, but before she says that, I was just going to say that we know that there are um, that there are cases of mpox that are associated with like um, lying very close together without clothing on, for example, like close contact um, mm -hmm. with the expo with the lesions that are in the genital region, and so. We, we know of individuals who have said that they've had penetrative sex. We've also had people who have said that they've had receptive sex. We also know about heterosexual women who seem to have acquired it through um, bisexual men. So it's just, as Dr. Quilter has said, it's, it's unclear the exact sexual practice but, um, and, and that's why this is intended to include all. But I know that Dr. Spicknall had his hand up and so I wonder Dr. Spicknall if you wanna add anything. Yeah, and this, forgive me if this is going into the weeds a bit, but there was a question regarding the types of behavioral adaptations that were occurring. Um, and I don't believe this was referring to condom use. This was more referring to decreased partner acquisition, um, particularly anonymous sex. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not only a personal individual level risk factor and, and behavioral adaptations that are occurring, but it's really a community, uh, you know, a, a groups of people acting together that, uh, in effect, decrease transmission. This is what the modeling um, evidence suggests. Uh, we do need so to I, move I really on. appreciate the conversation, but I just want to make sure that we're not making assumptions of behavior or increased risk based on gender identity status. That's my real concern here, um, because yeah. at, I'll let it go. Thank, thank you. Yeah, Dr. thank you, Dr. Middleman. We do have to move on, but I, you know, I, what I want to, what I think I am hearing, I just want to make a clarify is that um, there, in, in the adolescent population, for example, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Middleman is highlighting that we're, the assumption issue. <laughs> and so I, I, I do want to just echo that as we start to think down toward the adolescent age group, um, where probably there are less data that um, we, we do have to question um, sort of some of these uh, recommendations to ensure that we are um, not reinforcing, you know, potential stereotypes, I think is uh, the concern. So um, I will say we do need to move on. Um, and I, I want to just highlight that we still have two more presentations. Um, I'm going to just flag to the members in the room uh, that lunch will be a working lunch and uh, will be an abbreviated break. So just get ready uh, and also ask for uh, uh, efficiency over the next you know, 20, 30 minutes if we can. Um, we do have two statements. I'm gonna ask our colleagues to keep them as brief as possible. Uh, the first statement is from our colleague, Dr. David Boucher uh, from Asper HHS. And uh, I believe you wanted to uh, provide information about the US government response. Thanks a lot, and good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, since the identification of MPOX cases in the U.S. Uh, in May 2022, Asper has shipped over 1 million vials of Genios to federal and jurisdictional partners. Um, and as Dr. Rao and others mentioned, Genios was developed by Bavarian Nordic uh, and USG partners like BARDA, NIAD, others, uh, as part of the nation's smallpox preparedness program. Uh, given its safety profile, uh, particularly for those uh, immunocompromised individuals uh, and effectiveness in reducing frequency and severity of infections, there was a really strong, uh, really obvious justification to use doses held in the strategic national stockpile to uh, support the response. As we continue to move beyond the acute phase of the response, uh, ASPR is supportive of the transition of Genios to commercial distribution uh, as the next correct step uh, in ensuring continued access for those who wish to get vaccinated for MPOX. Um, I want to say also, we're also very committed to ensuring a seamless transition if this does go to commercial distribution. We are not going to have gaps in the availability of Genios uh, as we pass the baton on to our partners at Ovarian Nordic. 
um, to say just a couple more words about this quickly. Uh, in January of 2023, uh, we migrated jurisdictional ordering to a threshold-based system that's really similar to what we do for COVID vaccines and therapeutics, if you're familiar with that. Uh, at that time, we put 400,000 vials uh, into the combined thresholds across 64 jurisdictions. Uh, to date, uh, 57,000, about 57,000 of those have been ordered. Uh, and that means we still have uh, well over 300,000 vials uh, available immediately to jurisdictions anytime they need to restock uh, existing vaccination sites or supply new ones. Uh, we're going to keep this uh, supply reserved uh, for the jurisdictions uh, as we work with Bavarian Nordic uh, and HHS partners at CDC, CMS, and uh, several others over the coming months uh, if we do uh, need to plan and execute a smooth handoff. Uh, there was a question earlier uh, about the largest supply. Um, I, I can say quickly um, through our partnership with Bavarian Nordic uh, and a lot of great efforts that they've made to expand manufacturing capacity and deliveries over the last year and a half, we have significantly built up our Genios inventory in that period. If Genios transitions to commercial distribution uh, and there's a point where demand is outpacing BN's manufacturing capacity, Asper would still consider itself to partner with BN uh, and we'd be happy to work through ways that we might be able to support them and avoid any shortages. Um, I'll wrap there. Uh, I'm not going to miss an opportunity, though. Uh, I know there's a lot of people participating in today's meeting, watching, uh, who really play vital roles in providing care to patients uh, and bringing MPOX cases down. On behalf of all my colleagues at Asper, I just want to express our gratitude for everything you do uh, to keep people safe, healthy, uh, and thank you very much for the partnership throughout the response. Uh, back to you all. Happy to stay on for any questions there. Thank you, Dr. Boucher. Um, next, we'll have a, a very brief statement from colleagues from Bavarian Nordic, I believe, Dr. Kimok. Hello, everyone. This is Leanne Kimak from Bavarian Nordic. I'm the U.S. commercial lead. And at Bavarian Nordic, we'd really like to thank you and thank the CDC, the work group, and the committee for their tremendous efforts and their careful deliberations on this important public health issue. We're very proud to have partnered with the U.S. government in the successful response to meet the MPOX outbreak, including the rapid deployment of Geneos, but we realize vaccine access challenges still remain. We believe that the routine preventative recommendation for at-risk populations under, under consideration by the committee is a critical step forward in addressing these inequity and access challenges. This recommendation would allow providers and retail pharmacies to administer the vaccine where people are most comfortable seeking one, whether it's at the pharmacy, at their doctor's office, or at their neighborhood health clinic. If the committee votes for a routine recommendation for the at-risk population, putting MPOX vaccine on the immunization schedule, we very much look forward to commercializing Geneos here in the US. We have a robust manufacturing process and we have ample supply to meet the need. We also have an unwavering commitment to public health, and we look forward to working with the agency healthcare providers in the community to make this vaccine accessible to individuals at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll move on, Dr. Rao, to your second presentation, Clinical Guidance and Next Steps. Okay, yes. Just Actually, I realized before you leave with that slide, um, I do need, uh, we, we have a motion and a second on the table to go ahead with the uh, the vote, correct? Am I correct, Dr. Horton? <laughs> I believe that slipped in right in the beginning. That's correct, Dr. Lee. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez, um, sorry. Uh, Dr. Rao, you can move to your next slide. So, uh, Dr. Sanchez, did you have a quick question? Yes, I just wanted to uh, um, cost, ask. Sorry. Yes, exactly. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Ms. Kamak, did you um, have any comment about the anticipated price of the vaccine? Uh, sure. So the intended list price will be in the range of $200 to $270 per dose. As you know, the list price is a price that is then negotiated down in the contracting phase, depending on the particular reimbursement mechanism. And um, it comes down by 25 to 30% or more. So this is the range for the wholesale acquisition cost. Thank you. Dr. Rao, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
So uh, this presentation is dedicated to guidance about this uh, vote, should it be passed. So it's we're referring to vaccination before exposure to MPOX, not referring to post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and, we're, and we're also going to talk a little bit about next steps. So in terms of guidance, much of this is actually similar or actually even identical to what I presented during the June ACIP meeting. And so I'm going to... Um, just remind um, the listeners of what those things were, but much of it is the same. Um, um, it is specific to the population at risk for MPOX, and so um, if I if I if I don't indicate otherwise, please do keep in mind that everything, all of this guidance is referring to the individuals listed um, in the footnote, the people who would be eligible for the vaccine vaccine and for pre-exposure prophylaxis only. So for um, persons less than 18 years of age, we, we know we have to have clinical guidance. Genios is not licensed for that population. There's no pre-licensure pre studies in this population. And there's, but there also, uh, we know that there has been vaccine administered to this population. So on the right side of your screen, you can see um, um, the breakdown for the first dose of the, the Genios vaccine dose that was administered during this response for 12 to 17 year olds, for example. And there have been a good number of people who have been vaccinated in this age group, and we have not at CDC received any um, any any concerning safety signals in this population or um, uh, VAERS reports of um, of um, severe adverse events in, in in those individuals. There is that NIH clinical trial in progress. Uh, it sounds like we might see data in at the end of 2024, and so perhaps um, the earliest it could be presented to ACIPs in 2025. But that is. That is why um, what we are proposing is, is to have clinical guidance that say that adolescents at risk for MPOX may receive the Genios vaccine before exposure. And of course, we're referring to adolescents with the risk factors. Uh, as far as pregnancy or breastfeeding, um, available human data is insufficient to determine whether the vaccine has any risks in pregnant persons. We do, however, have animal model data that's uh, mentioned in the package insert. It, this includes uh, models uh, involving rats that have shown no evidence of harm to the developing fetus. There's no adverse events that have been reported to the, the US vaccine safety surveillance systems either, but um, among pregnant persons, but also we just don't know how many pregnant persons received the vaccine during this response. We don't have that data. Um, but it is reassuring that at least we're not seeing in various reports, for example, anyone actually indicating that um, that, it, that the adverse event was in a pregnant person. Um, similarly, for breastfeeding persons, this has not been evaluated, and we have not seen adverse event reports reported via uh, the U.S. vaccine safety surveillance systems. Genius is not contraindicated in pregnancy or while breastfeeding, and we have stated as such um, in the occupational recommendations that were published uh, about the use of Genios last year. And um, after discussing with our ACOG uh, work group member and others, we've determined that um, the clinical guidance will be that pregnant or breastfeeding persons at risk for MPOX may receive the Genios vaccine before an exposure. And again, we're referring to those people with the risk factors, not all pregnant or breastfeeding persons. Moving on to healthcare personnel. So healthcare associated MPOX infections have been rare. I already explained this during the Q&A session, but we've seen very few cases as we talked about in June, um, especially when you know people are using personal protective equipment, which they should be using. Um, the concern is, is very, very low. And so Genios is not recommended as a routine vaccination. And during the June meeting, we, we expressed that there is gonna be clinical guidance in that published, um, in the published ACIP recommendations that indicates that it doesn't need to be routinely given to, um, to healthcare personnel. But after um, evaluating the, the benefits and the risks and the specific situation and whether PPE is available, it could be offered to um, some healthcare personnel in the United States, just, just certainly not, not routinely at all. Um, myopericarditis, we, we already talked about this as well during one of the Q&As. There is a known risk after ACAM 2000, which is the other orthopox virus vaccine used in the United States. The mechanism, however, is unknown for that myocarditis, and so there, and, and so we have that theoretical risk still at the back of our minds for Genios that hasn't been ruled out yet. Um, there, the um, uh, we know there's a known risk after COVID nineteen vaccines, particularly in adolescent and young adult males, and that's the reason that the CDC website has the guidance about the co administration of Genios 
um, with COVID-19 vaccines. And I know there's a lot of text on the slide, but this is literally uh, verbatim what is listed at, on the, the COVID-19 interim clinical considerations. It says there's no required minimum interval between receiving any COVID-19 vaccine and the Genios vaccine, regardless of which vaccine is administered first. And then it says people, particularly adolescent and young adult males, who are recommended to receive both vaccines might consider might consider waiting four weeks between vaccines. This is because of the observed risk for myocarditis, pericarditis after receipt of AKM 2000 orthopox virus vaccine and COVID-19 vaccines and the hypothetical risk for myocarditis and pericarditis after the Genios vaccine. However, if a patient's risk for MPOX or severe disease due to COVID-19 is increased, administration of Genios and COVID-19 vaccines should not be delayed. Um, uh, for regarding um, the Genios vaccine and immunoglobulin products, the work group talked about this in detail, and this was presented to ACIP during the June meeting. The reason this came up is that technically the Genios vaccine is a live virus vaccine. It is a non-replicating virus vaccine, though, and so we uh, determined that there are no precautions necessary if Genios is administered in close jump or proximity to intravenous immunoglobulin or IVIG. Um, with regards to vaccinia immune globulin intravenous or VIGIV, which is a product that basically is called from um, persons who are vaccinated with ACAM 2000, for example, it, 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 it perhaps could interfere with immune response to the Genios vaccine. And so ideally administration of Genios should be delayed if VIGIV was recently administered. The reason that VIGIV is, is probably administered to a patient is a severe manifestation of MPOX. And so at this time, those are, those are persons for whom vaccination would not even be recommended since they are, um, they've acquired MPOX. And uh, currently the recommendation is that people who have recovered from MPOX do not need to be vaccinated. Um, and so we we don't think that this is something that would would come up often, if at all. Um, if it does come up, though, public health consulta consultation should be obtained for case specific guidance. Now, as far as contraindications and precautions go. Um, Genios was licensed for prevention of smallpox in addition to prevention of MPOX. And so because smallpox is nearly always life threatening, there are no absolute contraindications for the use of Genios to prevent small smallpox. And that's why the package insert as well um, um, doesn't really list an absolute contraindication. However, for MPOX, the considerations may be difficult, may be different. And so consistent with contraindications and ACIP's routine schedules, the work group proposes that what be listed as Genios is contraindicated in patients with severe allergic reaction, example anaphylaxis, after a previous dose of the vaccine or to a vaccine component. And that under precautions, same similar to what is listed for, for pretty much all the vaccines, moderate or severe acute illness with or without fever. So these two things, the contraindications and precautions are, are um, nothing, nothing different from, from all the other vaccines really. And then other administration guidance, um, we really wanna stress that completion of the two-dose series should be encouraged. Um, if there's one message that hopefully comes from this meeting, it is that MPOX cases are still occurring. This is not over. Um, and if people got only one dose or people did not seek the vaccine because uh, there wasn't as much availability last year, we hope that they will um, uh, they will reach out now and get vaccinated as much as possible. That second dose uh, getting into arms would be really um, really, really great for those individual patients and for their friends and and others. The second dose should be administered as much as possible about 28 days after the first dose, but unintentional delays in receiving that second dose, even if um, it's been a year, um, does not require restarting the series and the second dose should just be administered as soon as possible. And then in terms of next steps, Dr. Uh, Sanchez already went over this. And so I just want to orient everyone to the fact that our work group is not completely going away. Um, we will publish the uh, these these two these two MMWR ACIP recommendations about the use of Genios during outbreaks, as well as the use of Genios among persons at risk during the ongoing MPOX outbreak, because they're very complementary. We'll do that early in 2024. Whenever we have the data from NIH, the work group will reconvene. Perhaps we'll reconvene at the end of 2024, but um, it, it probably won't be presented to ACIP until 2025. And then a few years down the road. Whenever we have um, 
uh, more data about the epidemiology to help us decide whether or not this uh, recommendation should be continued. Uh, we will um, revisit the ETR, review the epidemiology, cost effectiveness analysis, and other data, and, and uh, bring that back to ACIP to determine whether this should be continued. Now, um, in the interim, this recommendation would exist if it's passed. If, um, if the vaccine does become commercialized, then of course there'll be additional things that we would need to do. And that is the end of, um, of um, my presentations. Again, I'd like to acknowledge the people listed on this slide for everything that they've done to help us um, with this clinical guidance. And I'm happy to take any questions before Dr. Santoli gives her VFC presentation. Thank you, Dr. I'll ask our uh, colleagues to keep it brief. Dr. Paling. Uh, thank you for a second wonderful presentation, and I very much appreciated the tentative timeline and the thought of continuing to evaluate the impact and making sure the um, recommendations are precisely um, and uh, and having the desired impact. I wanted uh, one of the questions that we've focused on a lot is on safety, and in the uh, myopericarditis. I wanted just to make sure that I understood the right information. And so um, in the many doses that have been administered in the United States of Genios during this MPOX, we have not seen a signal for myopericarditis in, um, during this outbreak. Um, however, um, in both VAERS or in um, VSD, the vaccine safety data link. And that doesn't exclude that it could occur rarely, and that's why we've got the wording. Is that correct? Thank you. Yes, that's correct. And I'll just um, ask Dr. Jonathan Duffy, who is our vaccine safety expert for the Mpox vaccine, to see if he wants to add anything else. But, but, but yes, what you said is correct. Yeah, I, I don't really have anything to add. I mean, that, that's correct. Thank you. Dr. Lair. Um, thank you for the presentation. I have one question and one comment. Um, I think the manufacturer was Dr. Mott. And if she could comment on how long it, the manufacturer thinks it would take to commercialize this. Is this something on the order of 18 months or three years? Just curious. Following on our colleagues from Bavaria Nordic. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. So we actually began taking steps towards commercializing the product as soon as we learned that the ACIP would be considering a recommendation. So if Chineos is routinely recommended for those at risk of MPOX, this would allow us to move forward with uh, some of the steps towards commercial insurance coverage. So we do anticipate that it will take a number of months to negotiate these contracts and, and of course, um, you know, be prepared to work through all the necessary steps with a variety of payers, setting up the distribution channels to store and administer the vaccine. Um, and, and as we've seen, you know, with the commercial transition of the COVID vaccines, this process can take some time, um, but I, I wouldn't foresee it, uh, you know, being uh, outside of the six to nine month range. Thank you very much. Um, if we could go mm -hmm. back two slides, I really want to emphasize this comments here about the interim recommendations, the need for a cost benefit analysis, that we're basically voting and approving something where this could be extremely costly and we don't have a sense of that. I'm in favor of this where we are now, but I would want this to be reviewed as soon as we have more information, which I'm sure will happen, but just want to emphasize that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Lair. Actually, um, I, I feel like in a sense, to Dr. Long's earlier point, all of our recommendations are interim recommendations that should be revisited at any moment. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was going to re recommend dropping the terminology interim recommendation, just like we don't have strong recommendations or not strong recommendations. Um, however, I, I take your point about the cost effectiveness analysis and the unusual nature by which this uh, vaccine uh, is coming to market uh, makes it a little complicated. Um, so I will 
just leave it at that, but suggesting to the committee that, or to, to our colleagues at CDC, that we try not to use that term interim recommendations, but rather we just have a clear recommendation to re-review the data in X period of time. I think that would be fine, similar to what we did with pneumococcal vaccine. Okay, I don't see any additional hands raised, so I would like to go to Dr. Santoli. Hi, um, so um, wanted to share the VFC resolution for your consideration. Um, everything is new here, so the yellow and white coating doesn't apply. Uh, the purpose of this resolution is to add a vaccine for the prevention of MPOX to the Vaccines for Children program. Next slide. Um, under the eligible groups, the eligible groups, and this is similar to what we've seen on the prior slides, children aged 18 years of age at increased risk of MPOX, including persons who are gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, transgender or non-binary people who in the past six months have had at least one sexually transmitted disease, more than one sex partner, sex at a commercial venue, sex association with a large public event in a geographic area where MPOX transmission is occurring, or persons who are sexual contacts of the persons described above, or persons who anticipate experiencing any of the situations described above. Next slide. The recommended schedule and dosage intervals are two doses given 28 days apart. Next slide. The recommended dosages, um, you're referred to the product package inserts and for contraindications and precautions. Uh, similarly, for the contraindications, the package insert precautions include moderate or severe acute illness with or without fever. Next slide. There will be a statement, um, again, referencing future published recommendations that will be incorporated by reference. Next slide. I think given the other discussion that we've had, this slide was added to kind of convey the timing um, that MPOX vaccines will not be available through the VFC program immediately following the passage of this resolution because they are not yet commercially available. And as Dr. Boucher mentioned, at this time, MPOX vaccines remain available under the HHS MPOX vaccination program. Following the passage of this resolution, we will begin the steps necessary to solicit for and award contracts for MPOX vaccines. And the timeline for availability of MPOX vaccines commercially or through the VFC program has not yet been finalized. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Santoli. Uh, Dr. Talbot. I just want to point out that this vaccine is the perfect example of we need vaccines for adults. Okay, um, now that I've gotten off my soapbox, um, can I give a motion to, to set this language? Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. So uh, there's a motion on the table to approve the VFC language. Uh, Dr. Paling? May I please second that motion? You may, so it's been moved and seconded and we will have this uh, VFC resolution uh, for our vote section later. Any other comments or questions? Okay, excellent. Thank you everybody for being so efficient. Um, and thank you to our speakers from the MPOX vaccine sec section and for such a thorough review, we really appreciate it. Um, we are going to take a brief very brief break. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask that folks come back at five minutes after the hour, uh, where we will begin public comment. Uh, Dr. Wharton, is that all right? Or would you like to reconvene uh, sooner? Uh, no, I think that's fine, Dr. Lee. Okay. So five minutes after the hour, we will plan to reconvene for public comment. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your contributions, and we will talk again very soon. <laughs>